Oh, well, hello everyone. I entitled this talk, Giving the Best Presentation of Your Life Every Time. And I'd like to share a little story with you uh, in my life regarding this issue. Have you ever had that experience where you show up to give a talk early in your career, not now when you know what you're doing, but early in your career, you got up to give a talk and you felt very sick to your stomach. You felt as if you were going to perhaps chuck your cookies. Well, I did that. I actually did that. And unfortunately, I did not make it out of the room before I did that. Uh, that's kind of hard to live down. It was at the very beginning of the semester in this class, and it was uh, a rough semester after that, being known as the person who barfed on the first day. Um, but it turned me into a person who had a terrible fear of public speaking. In fact, I picked my classes based on whether or not I had to give a public talk. And it wasn't enough another 10 years before I was forced to give a talk. Um, I gradually became used to it and I turned ultimately from an avoider into a seeker. I now will give a talk for anybody on any topic at any time. And I hope that those of you who do not enjoy public speaking will learn to enjoy public speaking. Um, and that those of you who are already good at it will be even better after I share some of the hard won secrets that I have for giving uh, public speaking. So of course I have no disclosures for today's presentation. I'd like to talk about a couple of different things. The first is tricks of successful speakers. In this particular uh, series of lectures and if you are live at this uh, conference, you're seeing some of the best of the best. And what makes them so great at what they do? They're not just giving good information, they're giving good information particularly well. And how do they do that? The second part is developing the talk. If you don't develop the talk well, then you're not going to be able to give a good talk, right? And then the performance itself. And then, you know, make no mistake about it, this is a performance. You are up there, uh, very much giving a play and taking people from point A to point B. Um, and we wanna be able to do it well. And lastly, I'd like to spend a few moments talking about handling the jitters for any of you who might still be a little bit nervous about this whole process. So let's start with the tricks of successful speakers. What do they do that we don't do? Well, they certainly know every aspect of their talk, the subject itself, but also themselves, their audience, and the room. They prepare very well for the performance. All of the people that you've heard at this, at this conference and in these lectures, all of them have rehearsed these talks numerous times before delivering them, even though they've done it 10 or 15 times before. They rehearsed it again, and they practice smooth transitions from the beginning to the end. This should be a story. Every talk should be a story that starts at the very beginning and ends at the end with a nice smooth transition all the way through. So they know their subject and of course their slides and they know them cold. If the electricity went out, they would be able to give the talk virtually verbatim. They know all of the details of their topic and sometimes the backstory is a little bit more interesting than the story itself. Let me give you an example of this. I've had to do a lot of talks over my time where we talk about toll-like receptors. Where did that word come from? Why do we call it a toll-like receptor? Well, the story goes that when toll-like receptors were first being discussed in a group of scientists in, with a group of scientists in Germany, um, they all were absolutely amazed at these receptors. And the word for cool in German is apparently toll. And they were sitting there going, wow, toll, toll. And that's how toll-like receptors got named. So it's a cute little backstory, right, that you can share in the middle of having to talk about something quite dull, like toll-like receptors. An excellent speaker has also read every reference and they remember the details. Perhaps they've even brought a copy of, the, of it with them. I have a story here too. I was giving a talk one time where the most important study, the thing that the, my outcome of my talk 
hung on the success of this particular study. And I needed my audience to believe this particular study in order to get to my conclusions. I was talking about the study. Somebody raised a hand and said, how many people were in this study? I didn't know the answer to that. Now, of course, this is the day of, of Dr. Google, right? So I went on with my talk and somebody Googled it while I was going on with my talk to tell me that there were only 25 people in the study. And I really should have introduced this study as a pilot study, therefore, right? Because now my entire outcome of my talk was hanging on a very, very small study. And I had lost all, all of my credentials. Uh, nobody was going to believe me after that. So you want to remember the details for these studies that you're talking about or bring a copy of it with you so you can leaf through uh, and tell them the answer then and not have somebody doing Dr. Google on you. So my goals ever since the episode back in college, first of all, not to make a fool of myself first and foremost, but I also obviously wanted to be great. And your successful speakers are great because they have passion and they have excitement. People often say to me after I give a talk, wow, you really care about that subject. And that's what you wanna be portraying as you're talking about it. You also want it to be remembered, right? That would be a good thing. Well, a gentleman named Ebbinghaus many years ago said, when you give a talk, 40% of it is gone within a half an hour. 60% is gone by the end of the day and only 10% remains at the end of the week. So the goal and the success of successful speakers is that they improve retention of that 10%. I have to accept that 10% is all that you're going to remember, but I want that 10% to be the most important part, the part that I want you to remember. And we do that with simple, focused, and unambiguous messages. My public speaking teacher that I had to hire after the incident back in college taught me that the best way to give a talk is to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them that you told them. So you're repeating your most important information at least three times, if not more. Another way to improve retention is to have that message, that thing I want you to remember, hit your audience in the heart, the stomach, the wallet, or the gee whiz spot. Hitting people in the heart means that you really got to them. Sort of like those television commercials with the dogs that are out in the cold and shivering or out in the heat without any water, right? Hitting you in the heart where you want to do something about it. Hitting you in the stomach, where all of a sudden you feel sick to your stomach. Oh my gosh, I've done that before. Or, oh my gosh, I never did that before. Have I hurt my patients? Am I going to get in trouble, right? Am I a lawsuit waiting to happen? That sort of thing. Hitting them in the wallet is great. If your message allows them to make more money, they're going to remember it. And then lastly, the gee whiz spot, when you tell them something sort of like that toll-like receptor, you're probably not going to forget that, right? When you hit them in the, wow, that's pretty cool. It's an interesting piece of trivia that I'm going to store away from an, for a rainy day. They're much more likely to remember it. Successful speakers also know themselves. They're knowledgeable, but very humble. Have you ever seen a speaker up there who's obviously exceedingly full of him or herself? and kind of vain and obnoxious, that's not, that's not a speaker that we remember as a great speaker. People who speak conversationally and especially from personal experience are usually the ones that you'd go back to hear over and over again. A good speaker also knows his or her limitations. I have several. The first is that I know now that I don't play well in the deep south of the United States. I discovered that the hard way. I'm a woman. I'm a Yankee and I'm irreverent. None of those play well in the South. So I don't accept speaking engagements anymore in the deep South because I just don't do well. I also am really bad at telling jokes. If you tell jokes, it's a quick <laughs> trip to disaster unless it's really funny and you're very, very good at delivery. 
far easier and safer to tell a story. I thought the story about me throwing up at one of my first public speaking events was kind of funny. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but I don't need you to laugh for that story to go over fairly well, right? When you tell an actual joke and it doesn't go over well, you hear crickets and you look like a deer stuck in the headlights. So I do not recommend it. And success, a successful speaker also knows their audience. What do I mean by that? You need to ask who your audience is going to be when you're invited to give a talk. Where do you need to start, right? And you may need to redo your slides to be better for that particular audience. Have you ever seen a speaker who uses a medical, their canned medical talk to do a lay public speaking talk? where there's all sorts of medical ease on the slides, you need to redo those slides each and every time. I just gave this talk in Peru three weeks ago. I realized as I was going through the talk that I had all sorts of American idioms in there, like handle the jitters and knowing things cold and gee whiz spots. And I had to get rid of all of those because I knew that the interpreter was gonna have a hard time translating that uh, into Spanish for the audience. So get rid of those things and change the slides so that they're appropriate to suit the needs of the particular audience that you have. Sometimes I'm asked to speak to a residency program and my audience includes medical students and residents and PAs and NPs and uh, attendings who have been in the business for many, many years. If I don't start at the beginning, the medical students are going to be lost. If I start, however, if I start at the beginning, I'm going to bore the heck out of the people who are more advanced, right? So sometimes it helps to just say, I'm going to use a few slides here just to make sure we're all on the same level at the beginning. Does somebody need to be acknowledged? I've given a talk where the person who wrote the book on the topic I was speaking on was sitting in the audience. So you want to know that ahead of time, and you might want to acknowledge Dr. A in the very beginning saying something like, I can't believe I'm here to talk about uh, psoriasis when the world's expert Dr. A is sitting right here. Um, you might want to refer to Dr. A numerous times during your talk so that when you hit the Q&A, you're not blindsided. So you've sort of made, made the friend of that expert sitting in the audience. It will make you feel a whole lot more comfortable as well. You wanna know what time of day you're going to be speaking. This is in a, one, in a full day's uh, symposium. This is particularly important. Are you the last speaker before lunch and everybody's hungry? Are you the last speaker of the day and everyone wants to go home? Are you the first speaker after lunch and everybody's going to be falling asleep and you need to be particularly energetic? You also want to know who or what came before your talk and what is going to be coming after your talk. Um, sometimes the symposium, you're the only person speaking on acne that day. Well, then you can do whatever you want, but occasionally the whole day is acne. In that case, you really ought to make contact with the people who come before you and that come after you to make sure that you're not overlapping to a great extent. I'm sure you've all seen speakers who had to fast forward through a bunch of slides saying, well, we already covered this, we already covered this. It looks terribly unprofessional. So you wanna make contact with your fellow speakers to know um, that your, your content is almost entirely new to the audience. You also want to be there for the talks that come before you if it's on the same topic as you so that you can refer back and say, as Dr. Harper mentioned before, right, or as Dr. Webster is going to mention in a few moments, so that you can tie back and tie forward to give continuity not only to your talk, but continuity to the whole day. And an excellent speaker finally also knows the space. What on earth do I mean by that? There is no such thing as being too early for your talk. You wanna come in and get the lay of the land. You wanna meet the room monitor by name. This room monitor and the AV monitor are going to save you if there's any kind of audiovisual failure. And knowing their name is very helpful. 
Are the lights too bright so that they're not going to be able to see your clinical slides? Are the lights too low so that if you're speaking after lunch, people are going to be falling asleep? Is the lectern really high? I'm a very short person. I often can't see over the lectern, so I need something to stand on, or better yet, a lavalier microphone so that I can stand to the side of the lectern. And finally, how does the pointer work? Each pointer works differently, and you look kind of silly if you keep making a mistake uh, with advancing forward or backwards. So no such thing as being too early. So now let's move on to developing the talk. A talk has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and each one of them has a different purpose. The beginning is to catch people's attention, right? To clearly state that message up front. My message today is that kumquats cause cancer. And I'm gonna tell you that right in the very beginning. Today, we're gonna talk about how kumquats cause cancer. This is to get your attention because getting your attention is a prerequisite to communication. If you're not hearing me, you're not going to understand what I have to say. I think it's best to state your purpose up front. Sometimes you'll hear a talk where the speaker is actually saving the main event as sort of a punchline at the end of the talk. I don't think that's a great idea, especially if your conclusion is going to be something rather far-fetched, like kumquats cause cancer. I think that the listener is better able to judge how well my data substantiates my premise that kumquats cause cancer if you know that's where I'm going. So I think, again, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them that you told them is the best way to get somebody's attention, grab their attention, um, and then start to show the data, which occurs in the middle of your talk. So the entire middle is just to prove what you promised you were going to prove, that kumquats cause cancer. Without this middle part, no one is going to believe me at the end, right? The take home message is not gonna go home. But this entire section is gonna be forgotten. None of this is gonna be part of that 10%, right? This is just to prove from point A, what are kumquats? why might they cause cancer, and then proof that they do, right? So the whole thing is going into the memory hopper, but it's a crucial part of your talk. And then at the end, you're going to repeat your statement that kumquats cause cancer, maybe add one or two key supporting points from that middle part. Remember that we saw this, and remember that we saw that, which is why we believe that kumquats cause cancer. My end is rarely longer than a minute, and it's crucial to make it foolproof. In my career, I always started off at the beginning, making sure that that part was foolproof, because that's when I'm at my maximum amount, amount of nervousness. I want to make sure I start like gangbusters and get everybody's attention. So I always made the beginning foolproof and sort of thought the end was just going to happen when it happened. But the end has to be foolproof also because you're bringing it home, right? So it's going to be short, but it has to be clear and emphatic delivery with your eyes locked with the audience. So make very sure that your end is simple and absolutely foolproof so that you can bring it home and end up saying, you know what? Kumquats cause cancer, right? So now let's talk quickly about the performance itself. It's definitely a performance. The audience came because they like live presentations. They preferred this. They came to hear and see you for a reason because they, for some reason, don't enjoy getting their information from a book or from a journal. They like to hear it and they like to see it probably because we're very visual people, right? Ebbinghaus also showed us that they remember more about you than they remember about your topic. You're more likely to remember my curly hair than you are anything that came out of my mouth. So make sure that you're happy with your costume because they're gonna remember it. And just give them a shout. 
And a show consists of scenery and lighting and costume. And of course, most importantly, an amazing delivery. I think the essential aspects of delivery are eye contact, gesturing, and emphasizing what you want people to remember. So let's start with eye contact. Eye contact is very interesting. And you might think eye contact, you're in a big room with a whole bunch of people, how are you gonna make eye contact? Well, eye contact in an audience, I see as akin to playing catch in baseball. So when you're playing catch, you throw the ball on purpose to be caught, right? This is not tennis where I'm hitting it over there so that you can't get it. When you're playing catch with your son or daughter, you are throwing it to them on purpose and you look to see if they caught it. Well, giving a lecture is very similar. I'm saying something to you and I'm looking to see if you caught what I just said. When your audience catches what you just said, they nod, they smile, they shrug, they say, uh-huh. They indicate to you that they caught what you were saying. And it's crucial for you to see if they caught it because if they didn't, you have to throw it a different way. If they're looking down at their cell phones, you have failed in your game of catch, right? How long should eye contact be? Well, short eye contact is very unsatisfying. It's very hard to show you this on a Zoom um, lecture, but audience uh, frequently, um, the speaker will sort of scan the audience and just sort of look. It, that's unsatisfying. Um, you want to actually look at a particular person or a group of people. On the other hand, long eye contact is super weird. Have you ever been the audience member where the speaker seems to be focusing entirely on you and is just looking at you? It gets super uncomfortable, right? Really fast. If they speak, if you speak to more than uh, to one person for more than, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds, it starts to get uncomfortable and they're liable to look away, most likely at their cell phone so that you will stop staring at them. So how long is too long? How short is too short? I think you should spend no more than one thought on an individual. So I look at you and I pay attention to you. And then I move on to the next person and then to the next person for a single thought for the entire thought before I move on. That's just about the right amount of time. You wanna make sure that you're directing your attention to all corners of the room, not in order so that you look like an old fashioned typewriter, right? But look at each corner of the room, don't leave anybody out. In a very large room, if you focus on one person, there's a whole group of people behind them <laughs> that think that you're looking at them as well. What about gestures? Gestures are obviously very important. You can't make a plea without a gesture, right? If you're begging somebody for something, you're gonna hold your hands like this. Well, we're really kind of begging when we're giving a talk. And what we're begging for is for you to believe what's coming out of my mouth, right? Believe that I'm sincere, believe that uh, of the content of what I'm telling you. So gestures are very helpful in that regard. You certainly want to avoid standing still like a statue. It makes you look extremely nervous, but you also don't want to pace. That makes you look nervous also. Have you ever seen somebody, however, who gestures too much and is sort of flapping in the breeze? When you gesture too much, your gesture loses its impact. So you want to gesture and then put your hands down and let them be quiet for a little while before you do it again. You've probably also seen speakers who grip the lectern as if they're going to fall over. <clears throat> that makes them look nervous as well. But I had a friend who used to sort of lean on the lectern and put his hand in his pocket. That was a little too mellow, a little too relaxed. Uh, so you want to keep it professional, obviously. Emphasis is, I think, one of the most important things that excellent speakers do particularly well. An emphasis can be brought with a changing of the pace, with a pause, or with volume control. 
if you pace yourself too fast, it sounds like you're really, really nervous. And it also reduces audience comprehension or makes them think that you timed your talk poorly. You just realized that you're about to run out of time and now you're speeding through the remainder of the activity. It just sounds very, very unprofessional. On the other hand, too slow is super annoying, right? And your audience reads faster than you speak. So they're all ready to the end and you're still in the beginning and they're like, oh my God, this is gonna go on forever. So you don't wanna go too slowly either, but the kiss of death is a constant pace. You wanna be slowing down and speeding up and changing things around a little bit. <clears throat> but slowing down can be very, very impactful. So let's say that I'm giving this talk at a fairly constant pace and now I want you to pay particular attention to what I'm about to say. So slowing down at that moment makes people who maybe are doodling or on their cell phone look up because they realize that something has changed, something is different. And what's different is I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say. If you include along with a slowing down of the pace, a decrease in volume, it's even more impactful. <clears throat> So I'm speaking at a constant pace and I'm about to state the take home message, the thing that I want you to remember. So I'm going to slow down and get a little bit quiet. Maybe even pause before I say, kumquats cause cancer. It helps a great deal. Pauses are highly effective. They feel a little scary to you because it feels like you're not communicating. It might feel to you like the audience thinks that you've forgotten where you are in your talk, but what it really says is I'm relaxed, I'm thoughtful, I'm confident. You might wanna pause two to three seconds after giving a crucial message or right before you give the crucial message or before you, after you display a visual, because the audience is gonna pay attention to the visual and is not gonna be listening to you. So you might wanna show the visual, let it sink in, let them think about it a little bit before you move on. And also after asking the audience a rhetorical question, you're not really waiting for them to answer the question, but have you ever had a speaker say, so what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And then just move right ahead to tell you what they think about X, Y, and Z. If you ask a question, you need to give the audience at least enough time to ponder it in their own heads. You also might pause for a story or an anecdote. <clears throat> and at this moment, a word slide is quite distracting. You don't want all sorts of stuff up on the slide when you're trying to communicate a message specifically, perhaps if a story or an anecdote, you're trying to say something to the audience personally. One of the ways to do this is by utilizing the B and the W key on the laptop in front of you. Now, I've already checked this out. It turns out for some reason in, this, in a Zoom meeting, the B key doesn't work, but the W does. So uh, here I am talking to you. I wanna share a story. I hit the W key and hopefully your screen has gone white. And now I can talk to you without you having something distracting behind me. If I hit the W again, the slide comes back. Now in the real world, that happens with the B key as well. If you hit the B, it goes to black. And if you hit the B again, it comes back to the slides again. Uh, for some reason that doesn't work on a Zoom meeting, but this is a very useful tool, especially if you're at a dinner program and you're trying to share something or perhaps ask a question of the audience and you don't want there to be uh, things behind you. <clears throat> One of the other crucial things that excellent speakers do is to smooth out the talk. And you can do this by bridging, by something called a tie back, where you talk about something that you said earlier, or maybe something another speaker said earlier, or a tie forward, which is sort of a sneak preview. In a few moments, we're going to talk about X, Y, and Z, or I'm sure that Dr. A is gonna talk about this in the next talk, right? So you're tying back or tying forward. But the absolute most helpful thing uh, of successful speakers is learning how to bridge between slides, which is what I just did. 
you start talking about the next concept before you advance the slide. Now, of course, this requires that you know your talk cold so that I knew that as I finished talking about this, that I was that the next slide said bridging between slides. So now I say, and one of the best ways to smooth out the talk is by bridging between slides and, and use it actually in the sentence. You can say something like, now that we understand X, what about bridging between slides? Now this leads us to ask, what is bridging between slides? And it makes it extremely smooth. The speaker that you'll hear at this meeting, who I think bridges the best of anyone, is Julie Harper. The next time you listen to one of her lectures, recognize how well she bridges between slides. The last thing I'd like to talk about is dealing with industry slides, because we all have to do it, and it's very difficult. The first thing is that you have to know every single word on the slide. I had this slide one time. Uh, an industry slide that I had to talk about. I thought I knew everything on this slide. I was able to talk all the p-values, everything. I knew everything on this slide, except it turns out the one thing that somebody asked me about, which is what is MI? I know now that it stands for multiple imputation and I know what multiple imputation is, but I did not at the time I talked about this slide. So make sure you read the fine print down at the bottom and that you know what every single thing on the slide means. Add up the numbers on the slides. Sometimes industry makes a mistake and they add up the numbers incorrectly. I have been called on this numerous times, so I've learned my lesson. Let's go back to this slide. Look at the ends down at the bottom. The end started out at 217 and then it went down from there, right? But then all of a sudden at week four, it went up again. Why did it go up again? What did that mean? Well, I know what it means now, but when I was asked that question at the time, I did not know why the number went back up again. So pay attention to the numbers, make sure that you understand them. If they're additive, make sure that they were added correctly because it will come back to haunt you, I promise you. You can't change the slides, but if you know them cold, you can really punch what it is that you wanna say and make it a little bit more interesting. You can include aspects of the backstory, like I mentioned before with that toe-like receptor. Sometimes the slide says 40% of side effects are yada, yada, yada. You can change it to four out of 10, or you can find a comparator. 40% of patients experience this. Well, you know, 40% of patients who take aspirin get gastric ulcers. You know, find something that you can compare that 40% to. My favorite thing to do is if a year is mentioned, find something interesting that happened in that year or on that date. I have a slide that starts off with the fact that tretinoin came into the market in 1971. Well, Google search told me that 1971 was the year that the first email was sent. Kind of interesting, right? So find anything that you can to make it a little bit more conversational and allow you to take a step back from the slide deck just for a moment. So the last thing is handling the jitters. And this is a good thing to end with because handling the jitters, it turns out, is exactly the way that you give an excellent presentation, which is to know more than anyone else in the audience. If you know that you've read every single paper, there's really nothing that anybody could fault you on, right? Never rely on somebody else's interpretation of the data. Have you ever, in a talk, watched, uh, what, watching a talk, noticed a reference down at the bottom and said, oh, I want that reference, and you copied it down, right? only to find out that that reference doesn't exist, or even worse, which has happened to me numerous times, you get that reference, you read it, and the thing that the speaker said was in the paper is not, right? So never rely on somebody else's interpretation of the data. Make sure that you read the paper. And as I said before, know you're supporting data cold. You don't have to know exactly how many people were in the study, but at least sort of a uh, ballpark, right? Is it 4,000 people? Is it two? Right? It's always helpful. And lastly, your opinions are always safe. You can be challenged, but you can't be overruled. So instead of saying drug X causes this, 
you can say something like, in my experience, I have found that drug X causes this. Somebody can challenge you and say, I've never seen that. You say, well, I have, right? So you can be challenged, but you can't be overruled. So it's a little bit safer. Practice, practice, practice out loud, standing up. I delivered this talk myself at least four times before today. Out loud, standing up, looked like an idiot, but what looks good on paper may sound contrived when you speak it, or you might need to change the slide because it's not appropriate for the way in which you speak. It also allows you to get accurate timing. When somebody invites you to give a five minute talk, you should be giving a five minute talk, not a six minute talk. There are people in, in in the speaking uh, world who are known for going overtime on a consistent basis. Going overtime is rude and is disrespectful in my mind and you wanna make sure that you're on time. So find a topic about which you are absolutely passionate because passion begets the power that's behind your talk. Be yourself, prepare exceedingly well, practice until you feel super comfortable jazz it up for the performance. And the most important aspect of all of this is to have fun. Thanks for your attention.